Can we bring a dead person back to life after death? To test this, some experiments were conducted on dogs in the early 1900s that would send chills down anyone's spine. Take a look at this clip. This is not a living dog, but a dead one, whose severed head is connected to a machine that mimics the functions of the heart and lungs. Now, observe in this scene, as soon as the scientist applies sour citric acid to the mouth of the dead dog, it immediately starts licking it. But this is not the only evidence of responses in that dead dog. When light is shown into its eyes or a hammer is knocked on the table nearby, it responds to those stimuli as well. This just proves that the dog wasn't merely biologically alive, but also conscious of what was happening around it. But now the question arises, how is this even possible? I mean, apart from the brain, heart, and lungs, proper functioning of other organs is also necessary to stay alive. So, by just providing blood and oxygen, how was it possible to bring a dead dog back to life? Was it done? And has any such experiment ever been tried on humans? If yes, then what exactly happened to them? Well, today we'll dive deep into these scientific experiments on the revival of the dead because you know, there are many such cases in our society. Sometimes people are killed in the middle of the road and the onlookers are left confused about what to do. Some people don't take any action, thinking someone else will, while they wait. Then someone might wonder, what's the point of taking action when a person is already dying? So, exactly how much time does one have to save a victim's life or bring them back from the brink of death or even after death? You'll soon have answers to these questions. And along with that, you'll also learn some crucial life-saving skills from this video that can be very useful in emergency situations. The fear of death is the ultimate fear for anyone. And interestingly, experiments to bring people back to life were even scarier in the era when scientists conducted them. In today's age of human and animal rights, no one would even think of performing such experiments. So what was so special about the era 100 years ago that scientists didn't think twice before conducting these cruel experiments? The origins of all this trace back to the period between 1914 and 1923, which is considered one of the bloodiest periods in Soviet Russia, also known as the USSR. The entire decade is still referred to as the reign of death in Russia. During these 9 to 10 years, Soviet times were so grim that any measures taken for the country's benefit would lead to devastation and result in the loss of millions of lives. First, in 1914, the countries on Russia's western border, Austria, Hungary and Serbia, became the center of World War I, dragging Russia into the war and resulting in the deaths of 2 to 3 million soldiers. But this was just the beginning as between 1918 and 1921, a civil war breaks out, leading to mass migrations and the onset of epidemics. In 1921, a sudden and severe drought hits, causing the deaths of many millions more. In total, it is said that between 1914 and 1923, around 15 to 20 million Russians perished prematurely. How could one make up for all these deaths and corpses? Well, the new Soviet government at the time quickly implemented a new economic policy, which started to improve people's conditions and allowed them to slowly move on from their trauma and rebuild their lives, except for one group, the Soviet scientists. After seeing death up close, they became obsessed with it. Literally from the early 1920s, they published books, brochures, pamphlets, and even articles with titles like Life and Death. What is death? Death from the point of view of modern science, aging and death, the problems of death and immortality, death and revival, the enigma of death and so on. In fact, you might not believe it, but in 1924, a renowned pathologist, George L. Shaw, even suggested that there should be a separate scientific field dedicated solely to studying death. He proposed naming this field after the Greek god of death, Thanatos. Scientists wanted to understand what exactly death is in proper medical terms because you see science is all about fundamentals, right? Once the fundamentals are clear, technology can be built upon them, just like how we have developed advanced treatments and techniques with the help of science. The race started by Soviet scientists quickly involved scientists from other countries as well who wanted not only to understand death theoretically, but also to explore it practically. During this period, two scientists were willing to go to any lengths to revive a dead person. The first was Soviet scientist Sergei Brukonenko, and the second was American scientist Robert Cornish. Specifically, Robert Cornish is still known today as a mad scientist, 
because he was trying to bring the dead back to life with a giant type of seesaw. So what exactly did Cornish do? Well, he would bind a human corpse to a platform that moved like a seesaw. Then he would inject chemicals like adrenaline and heparin, which are blood thinners, and use the seesaw to move up and down, trying to circulate the blood throughout the body with the help of gravity. The idea was that oxygen would enter through the mouth and nose, mix with the blood, and then circulate through the body, potentially reviving the corpses. So now the million dollar question, did any of these corpses come back to life? Well, as you can imagine, none of the corpses revived using this method. However, according to Cornish, the fault lay with the corpses themselves. No, I'm serious. Cornish believed that too much time had passed since those people had died, and that's why the method didn't work. However, he claimed that if the experiment were conducted on freshly deceased bodies, it might work. So Cornish decided to experiment again, this time on five freshly deceased dogs, which he named Lazarus 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 respectively. The first three, as expected, remained dead on the teeter board, showing no signs of life. But surprisingly, the last two dogs were revived, suggesting that Cornish wasn't completely mad after all. What could be the scientific explanation behind this? We'll explore what the science behind this could be later because while this experiment might seem quite silly by modern scientific standards, did Cornish inadvertently crack some code to reviving dead bodies? To find answers to these questions, we need to shift our focus from the USA to the USSR, where Soviet scientist Sergei Brukonenko was also pushing the extremes to revive the dead. Unlike Cornish, his methods were considered a bit more scientific by today's standards, to the point that the artificial life support systems used in modern open heart surgeries are believed to be inspired by his experiments. On September 18, 1925, Sergei Brukonenko introduced a fascinating invention to the world. During a conference of Russia's top medical professionals, he presented a device called the Autojector. This device could mimic the functions of the heart and lungs. It essentially had two electric pumps connected via rubber tubes to the main veins in the neck. On the other side, these pumps were connected to an oxygen vessel where oxygen was added to the blood. Basically, Brukonenko's idea was that one pump would draw deoxygenated blood from the dead body and send it to the oxygen vessel, where oxygen would be added. The second pump would then inject the oxygenated blood back into the body, potentially reviving the dead organism. The experiment with the severed dog's head I showed you earlier was actually a live demonstration of this technique that Brukonenko publicly showcased, proving that his method worked and was better than Cornish's. However, unfortunately, the dogs whose heads he revived only survived for about an hour and 40 minutes. Brukonenko realized that he needed to make his technique more foolproof. So his next demonstration involved taking a whole dog cutting the main vein in its neck to extract all the blood to ensure the dog was dead, and then waiting for about 10 minutes to rule out any possibility of life. After 10 minutes of death, he connected the corpse to the autojector and tried to revive it. and then take a look at this footage. This is the same dog that was used in the experiment. You can see that it has fully recovered as if it had never died. This means he managed to literally kill and then revive a patient. Now after this success, you might be wondering if Brukonenko ever tried this technique on humans. Well, I searched extensively through academic records but couldn't find any documentation on that. However, one thing was clear from this experiment if blood and oxygen are supplied in the right amounts to a dead body within a 10 minute window, it might be possible to revive it. But think about it, why was the dog only kept dead for 10 minutes and no longer? You might have seen similar scenarios in movies, where doctors often say that if only the patient had been brought in 10 minutes earlier, their life could have been saved. So is 10 minutes really the final limit after which no one can be revived from death? To answer this question, we first need to understand the process of death. Death is not a single point event, but a process involving several stages that the body goes through. Even if a person loses consciousness suddenly, the body still undergoes this death process. When someone is dying, especially unnaturally, such as from an accident, the body goes through four major stages. First comes the shock. 
Whether the person falls from a height, is shot, or hangs from a fan, the initial trauma causes significant blood loss, severe restriction of blood flow, or organ damage. The body enters a shock state, trying to supply blood to the heart, lungs, and brain. At this stage, the victim's pulse rate increases, blood pressure drops, and extremities like hands and feet become pale and cold due to the diversion of blood. This is a crucial stage because if you can control the bleeding, say by covering the wound with a thick towel and applying pressure, you can delay the victim's death by several hours. Therefore, if you encounter someone with heavy bleeding from an accident, try to stop the blood loss first. But if the injury is extensive and the victim is bleeding from multiple places, what happens next? Well, in that case, the patient moves to the second stage called hypovolemic shock. Essentially, when the bleeding is severe, there may not be enough blood left in the veins to maintain adequate pressure for delivering oxygen to the organs. As a result, the organs start to receive insufficient oxygen. In this situation, the victim may initially appear weak and confused. Then their breathing becomes rapid and eventually they lose consciousness. At this stage, it is usually impossible to save the person on your own and most accident victims die at this level. However, this can be significantly mitigated if a certain intervention is made, which we will discuss shortly. At this stage, a person can only be saved in a hospital or medical facility because they need external blood and oxygen supply. If this is done, the patient's death can be delayed for a while and they can be pulled out of the critical phase. If this does not happen, the cells in all the organs will begin to die slowly due to lack of blood and oxygen, leading to the patient reaching the third stage of death, known as clinical death. Clinical death occurs when due to excessive blood loss, the heart stops beating and breathing ceases, resulting in no pulse and the monitor displaying a flat line. This stage is technically called clinical death. In the experiments by Bruhi Konko and Cornish, the dogs were revived after 10 minutes of this type of death. In clinical death, doctors typically have around 10 minutes to restart the victim's heartbeat. If this is not achieved, unfortunately, the patient enters the final stage of dying, known as biological death or brain death. At this stage, because the brain has been deprived of oxygen for several minutes, the cells in the brain and other organs die rapidly and control over bodily functions is lost. In this final stage, the victim's eyes may remain fixed in one position and the pupils become dilated. Unfortunately, this is the final stage of death. After this stage of death, nothing can be done. Millions of brain cells are literally dead and no medical procedure can revive them, just like a broken glass cannot be fixed to its original structure. Sometimes, even after clinical death, when a patient is revived, they might come back to life but many of their brain cells may have already died. This results in the patient either falling into a partial coma or becoming a living corpse. I mean, just think about it. Their heart is working, they're breathing, and maybe other organs are functioning, but their brain is dead. The brain cells are literally dead. They cannot see, hear, or even feel anything. They are like a living corpse with a beating heart. Take the case of cardiac arrest patient, Carol. Her heart had completely stopped, meaning clinical death had occurred, but she was revived after 45 minutes. So here the 10 minute limit was surpassed, and she was revived after 45 minutes. According to Dr. Sam Paranier, the main director of revival research at Stony Brook University in New York, Carol is not the only person. Many patients have been revived hours after death. Essentially, a technique called defibrillation is used to revive a patient after death. And this involves shocking the heart to restart its natural rhythm. You may have seen this in movies as well. A defibrillator machine is used with two pads placed exactly in position on the patient's chest and then a charge is released. Ideally, the heart should restart and beat with a normal rhythm on the first shock. If it does not, two more attempts are made and epinephrine injections are given to increase blood pressure, providing more oxygen to the heart muscles to help them restart in a normal rhythm. One very important point is that if the heart stops immediately, CPR would have been administered to the patient. This shock method significantly increases the chances of reviving a person as it involves mechanical heart pumping through chest compressions to circulate blood. In Carol's case, CPR was administered which is why she survived even after 45 minutes. Now, having discussed all this, what can we learn from it and how can we extend a helping hand to others? So, 
When we encounter an accident or a situation where someone is injured, how quickly should we get the victim to the hospital? In such situations, we often become confused about whether to rush to the hospital immediately or wait for an ambulance. To determine the right action, you need to make a quick decision about how much time the victim has left. In the medical field, there's a concept called time distribution of trauma deaths. This concept helps determine how much time a victim has based on the locations and severity of their injuries. The first category is immediate deaths, which means a person can die within seconds to a few minutes. How can you identify this? For instance, if the impact of an accident causes severe brain or spinal cord injuries, or if a major blood vessel is ruptured, the victim may only survive for a few minutes. Most of the time, in such cases, there's no chance for the patient to even reach the hospital. There are also other cases where immediate death can occur, as mentioned on the screen. The second category is early deaths, which refers to victims who might survive for a few minutes or die within a few hours. This category includes those with abdominal injuries, fluid accumulation in the lungs, or moderate bleeding throughout the body. Other similar cases are also visible on the screen. In these cases, with adequate first aid help, a victim can survive for a few hours before dying. The so-called golden hour after an accident is actually referred to in relation to victims in this category. The third and final category is late deaths. These deaths are mostly quite rare and generally occur several days or occasionally weeks after the injury. Mainly if there's an infection near the injury site or if the injury was unnoticed, complications can lead to the patient's death later. Now, why do most patients die within this golden hour and how can they be saved? Well, most patients die within the golden hour because the body goes into shock due to severe trauma, which can lead to critical organ failure if immediate care is not provided. In this crucial time, the body's need for oxygen and blood is at its peak and any delay in addressing these needs can result in irreversible damage. To save patients, well-equipped ambulances with advanced life support or ALS systems are essential. These include oxygen supplies, defibrillators, and trained medical staff who can stabilize the patient. Additionally, rapid response and continuous monitoring of vital signs play a key role in ensuring that the patient's condition is managed effectively until they reach the hospital. Access to proper emergency care during this golden hour significantly increases the chances of survival. Finally, friends, if God forbid you ever encounter an accident, please take action as quickly as possible. Don't wait for someone else to take charge. You are well aware of how crucial the golden hour is for any victim. If you feel that it will take time for the ambulance to arrive and the hospital is nearby, you can directly admit the patient to the hospital's emergency room yourself. Every minute here is extremely valuable, just like a person's life. So thank you for watching this science video till the end. I hope you have learned something new today. Don't forget to like and share this video. Until then, take care.